Well, let's begin. When you live your life, there's a large number of things you just take for granted, like fresh air, water, and some other things, gravity. And when you work in a large organization, there is a general background which you assume, a general ethos as well as rules. And these are not always well stated, just what is what. You acquire them more or less. Now it's worthwhile now and then for examining this background. And I could take language, but I'm going to choose mathematics as it's something which you've used all much of your life. You think you know it, but you probably have never really thought what is mathematics. I'm going to show you what it is. And I recommend it other things now and then. It's worthwhile stopping and ask yourself. For example, when I worked at Bell Labs for many years, there were a couple of times I said, well, what is Bell Labs? Joining Bell Labs was sort of like joining uh, some organization. Uh, you became gradually a Bell Lab person. You could tell them from other people, generally. There is something about the organization which molds the individual. Well, mathematics does it. Now, if you ask a mathematician, what is mathematics? He is likely to say the classic answer. Mathematics is what mathematicians do. And mathematicians do mathematics. Now, the definition is circular, and that's why mathematicians find it funny. But it's also an admission that they really don't know how to define mathematics. Now, that's not surprising. If I ask you to define love, and you look at things for a long while, you decide uh, it's different for different people. Mathematics is different for different people. Many things cannot be defined sharply. Now, at a cocktail party at our house one time on a Sunday, the head of the math department was there, and there was a daughter of one of our friends, and she didn't like statistics, was making some rude remarks about it. And he said, mathematics is nothing but clear thinking. And she tried some more remarks, and he said, mathematics is nothing but clear thinking. She tried some more remarks, and he said it a third time, so she finally shut up. It made an impression on me, but I would rather say mathematics is the language of clear thinking. We've invented this artificial language, quite different than any natural language. We use it for coping with logical situations. Now, don't say that I'm claiming that mathematics does a trick perfectly. But you've only compared mathematical communication with what the law or the IRS or various other people do when they try to say what they want in English. They're very hard to read. In mathematics is fairly clear what is meant. So it does a passably good job at making things more precise. Furthermore, it seems to be universal. I went to Los Alamos one time and for my summer two-week trip. I started asking the better people I knew, the smarter ones, if we are in communication with a distant civilization, will they have the same mathematics, essentially? And they all said, essentially, yes. They have to have something like Maxwell's equations so they could do the electronics to be in communication with us. They thought it would be safe. Thus, mathematics is a somewhat universal language beyond just the fact that it's the same language across the face of the Earth. The statement is it's going to be the same language throughout the universe. Now, I have to say essentially because of a number of features. In our Euclidean geometry, those two triangles drawn accurately would say to be congruent. But you have to take one of them out of the plane and flop it over. A distant civilization might have chosen to say there are either congruent or anti-congruent triangles. Given three sides, you either congruent triangle or anti-congruent. Again, what we call the sign, Ptolemy, in building his tables for the stars and astronomy, used twice the sign of a half the angle. Well, that's not a lot of difference. It's pretty much the same function. So if you allow me these kind of small differences, the claim is, yes, the mathematics will be pretty much the same, because the problem, clear thinking, is pretty much the same no matter where you go in the whole universe. 
So mathematics is, to some extent, the language of clear thinking. Now, over the years, there has emerged five schools of thought of what mathematics really is. The first one is the Platonic school. Now, you may remember Plato in ancient Greek times said that the idea of a chair was more real than a chair. A particular chair can wear out. It can be destroyed. This and that. But the idea of a chair is immortal. So he said. So he argued that the ideas were more real than the material world. Now the number seven and mathematical theorems are not material things. They're in the world of ideas. Now we have to be careful. The Roman numeral seven, the Arabic number seven, or the binary number seven look different, but they're the same seven. Now, seven, you have never tasted, touched, felt, seen, or anything else. None of your senses have ever appeared as seven. You've seen seven horses, you've seen seven students, but you've not seen seven. Mathematics is in this world of ideas, which is not the real world at all. He maintains the theorems are out there in this space of, of ideas as against material. He also gave a story, a parable, that man is sitting in a cave facing the back wall and all he sees is the shadows of life passing across the front of the cave. And from this you try, with divine guidance from the gods, to understand the external world. Now, a simple example. The world is clearly three-dimensional. When you look, the three dimensions drop onto a two-dimensional eyeball of yours. You do not see three-dimensional things, you see two-dimensional things from which you infer what the reality is. This is what Plato said, we infer things. Now you may argue, well, it sounds good, but uh, I don't really believe it. After all, at a picnic, a chair might very well be a rock to sit on. But you don't expect in your friend's house to have a great big rock to sit on in his living room. So maybe a chair isn't so fixed as Plato wanted you to believe. Still, the Platonic version. And his version, all the theorems are out there waiting to be discovered. Thus, a Platonist will say, I discovered this theorem. Hamming discovered error correcting codes. Now, if you were more of an engineer, you might say he created and I created error correcting codes. That's the difference. And most mathematicians when asked will speak of discovering a theorem, meaning that they are at heart a Platonist. They believe all those theorems are out there waiting to be discovered. All possible theorems are out there. They were there when the Big Bang occurred. Once the Big Bang occurred, Hamming error correcting codes were out there in that space of ideas waiting to be found. That's that version. The difficulty with it is quite simple. It doesn't account for the history of mathematics. It does not account for why definitions change. Although you could argue that, well, we change the definition because we get a better apprehension of what reality is. The fact is mathematics is continually changing. Definitions change and everything else. And it doesn't really account for the history of the changes in mathematics very well. And furthermore, that idea that all those theorems were there the moment the Big Bang occurred, where? Where is this world of ideas? It's a kind of a hard thing, although it's the most popular one. If you ask mathematicians what are they doing casually, they will respond heavily as if they were Platonists. If you push them, however, they'll promptly jump to the second version, namely mathematics as formalism. This is backed very much by Hilbert. <clears throat> Hilbert said, the postulates of Euclid are only strings of symbols. The theorems are strings of symbols. All mathematics is taking strings of symbols, using substitution, this string for that string, and so on. I simply transform one string into another string, and that's the proof. A strictly mechanical process. Now, this view is extremely popular among the artificial intelligence people. That's because what machines can do. 
They can transform strings to other strings happily. To paraphrase what Hilbert said, when rigor enters, meaning departs. You do not pay any attention to any meaning to anything. You manipulate these strings. And that's all there is in mathematics, manipulation of strings. It is all formal. There is no meaning to anything. There are just strings given to be substituted to get other strings. Well, if there's no meaning, as in some sense there's no meaning to moves in chess, if there's just a bunch of rules, how is it that mathematics is useful? How can I explain the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics? Mathematics has successfully predicted where the moon would be or where the planets would be. Unknown planets have been predicted in advance. We predicted how an atomic bomb would behave. We predicted how guided missiles and space flights would work. And most of the time we were right. How can it be this crummy mathematics will do this if all it is is blind formalism with no meaning? It's a little hard to accept that view, but it's defensible. And that is what will happen if you argue with a mathematician for a little while, what is mathematics? He will hide behind formalism and say, it's just simply substituting strings in for strings, because the position is logically defensible. It doesn't make much sense. It just does not fit in with reality, worth beans. Now, in the Middle Ages, there was a proof of a theorem, which I'm going to prove to you. All triangles are isosceles. I'm going to bisect that. I'm going to bisect the base. Now, I remember the bisect of an angle is equal distant from the two sides. I remember the bisector of a side, any point on it is equal distant. So this triangle one is congruent with that triangle two because three sides. This is a right triangle, two sides here. This triangle three is congruent to four, therefore that side is equal to that side. Now this one, I bisect that angle, I have the common side, and I have the side here. Triangle 4 is congruent to triangle 5, that side equal that side, that side is equal that side. Triangle, all triangles are isosceles. If that's what you learned in Euclid, wasn't it? Now, you know from what I will call metamathematics that the theorem cannot be true. You know there's something wrong but probably most of you don't know what's wrong with it. It was because of this kind of a thing that Hilbert said, well, you know, Euclid wasn't really adequate. He did not, in fact, worry about intersections and betweenness. He did not prove that two things would intersect. He did not prove what two things were in between there, such and such, so he added a mess of postulates on in betweenness and intersection. More postulates by far than you could ever start with. And when you do that, you find this intersection is outside, not inside, and the proof falls apart. So there is why the rigorous and Hilbert got to the idea, I will forget all meaning. I will not pay attention to any drawings or any meaning. I won't think about that. I will formally substitute one string in another. I will have formal mathematics. Now, when I was a graduate student, I heard about this and I thought. Now, I think there are something like 467 theorems in all of Euclid. Evidently, if he had not had postures about the in-betweenness, and intersections. The first time one of those points arose, he had not proved the theorem. And every time that theorem was used later on, he had not proved. So without going through the thing, you could easily imagine almost all the theorems in Euclid were not really proved. You're not really proved like that thing. You get well, how come what it was that Although 
Hilbert added a bunch of postulates on. No theorem in Euclid was wrong. Theor Euclid never proved theorems like that which were false. How could it be? Well, it's obvious, you say. <laughs> Hilbert knew the theorems were true. He had to find postures which would leave those theorems true. It doesn't take me more than a couple of days as a graduate student to stop and say to myself, but wait a minute. That was the position of Euclid. Euclid knew the Pythagorean theorem was true. He knew this and that and the other theorem. His problem was to find some postures which would support the known theorems. He did not lay down postures and make deductions. He had the theorems first, many of them. Mathematics simply is not the version you get that you lay down postures, definitions, and axioms, and make deductions. Au contraire, you start with a body of knowledge and you work your way backward. Thus, in error correcting codes, when I started out with string bit strings and I thought about an error, well, I'll mark the error as a one. Well, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to have to have one plus one is zero. I'm going to have to not one plus one is two. So what is this truth in mathematics? Where is it? Now, the Greeks believed that mathematics was true. Well, you heard this said a lot of times. What's more certain than one plus one is two? Well, you've sat through this class, and you know one plus one is zero is just as true. There isn't one bit of truth in all of mathematics. And this is what, of course, Hilbert recognized when he says, and I paraphrase him, when you start rigor, you give up all meaning. There isn't any truth in mathematics. Not one iota. And Klein has written a book, the title, Mathematics, the Loss of Certainty, in which he tries to show how inch by inch, from the Greeks believing that mathematics gave you the truth, to where we are now, we know there is not one bit of truth in mathematics. Now, to give you a version of one of the semi-Hilbert guys and a bit of a logician, Russell. He's really a member of the third school, the logicians. Russell and Whitehead wrote a three-volume work, one point, three thick volumes, which they tried to show that mathematics was merely logic. And one of his famous sayings is the following, which is I always find fine. Pure mathematics consists entirely of assertions to the effect that if such and such a proposition is true of anything, then such and such a proposition Another proposition is true of that thing. It is essential not to discuss whether the first proposition is really true and not to mention what the thing is of which it is supposed to be true. Well, you see with that much waffling, you see where they came out. And again, it does not account for the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. In spite of the fact there's no truth in mathematics, somehow we successfully predict atomic bombs, guided missiles, and everything else. And we do pretty well. Not infallibly, but we do quite well. So this second, third school of the logicians, who thought that mathematics really was a consequence of logic, and those three thick volumes are very thick, full of awful stuff, and almost nobody tries to read it, has been pretty well abandoned. So that school has not really worked too well either. We come down next to the uh, intuitionists. It's a curse of our language that something either is or is not. And a lot of mathematical proofs depend upon me showing if you assume contrary to fact, you led to a contradiction, the alternate must be true. The intuitionist said, well, <laughs> there may be a ground between yes and no. We don't believe this argument that if it is not A, then it must be not A. The excluded middle isn't so popular. The intuitions also believe that contrary to what Hilbert wanted to do, intuition is everything. If I do not have an intuitive feeling about mathematics, how am I to prove it? How am I ever going to do anything? And particularly, how am I going to rely on it for action in the real world? For example, Supposing you know a little bit about Lebesgue integration, which is a very high flutin thing, which integrates functions which have more than a countable number of discontinuities. I used to say at Bell Labs, 
If whether an airplane would fly, depends upon whether the function is Riemann integrable, which is the one you learned, or Lebesgue integrable, which is much worse at weird functions, would you fly in a plane if it wasn't Riemann but it was Lebesgue? And most people say, no, I wouldn't fly in it. If less the mathematics is close to our intuition, which is close to the application we're going to make, how we're going to use mathematics if we do not have a firm feeling for what is meaning and what our intuitions tell us. Therefore, intuitions, although they are vague and sloppy and can't argue easily with the logicians because they've adopted different standards, they are in fact what you must do if you're going to use mathematics in the real world to get anything. You have to have an intuitive feeling. Well, that's what the mathematics is and that's what the real world is and they sort of match. I can depend upon the mathematics and the other one matching or, you know, that's kind of far out. I really don't believe the world is that crazy. I don't believe the world can have functions which are more than the countable number of discontinuities. After all, I am told there's only a fine number of molecules in a whole universe, which is finite, just finite. How can it be a more than a countable number of discontinuities in anything? Well, it can't match the real world, apparently. Now, there's a the last one to call the constructivist, which I tend partly to be, and some people in computer science are. Normally, what we say is we lay down some postures, and if there is no contradiction to postulates, so we can prove there's no contradiction, then we say the thing exists. The constructivists say, you've got to show me how to construct it. I am not willing to believe something exists until you tell me how to make it. Now the constructivists have had a great deal of trouble. They cannot produce a lot of mathematics by their methods that we use. And so People in my position who tend to be constructivists and tend to be intuitionists, because I've used mathematics all the time, are in a bad way because periodically I use some of the other mathematics which I can't justify on those strict bounds of either intuition or constructivism. But none of the five schools I've mentioned have proved to be at all popular. Not one of them. I've told you I tend to belong to two of them, but I acknowledge that both of them are indefensible. And all five schools are not really defensible. They do not account for, in fact, what we do do from time to time. In particular, how is it that we say, well, you build a missile this way, you weigh so much, and you put so much thrust over here, and put some head course correction on, and you'll get to the moon. And we did. Now, there's some more troubles. For some people in computing, like me at times, the real numbers are only the bit pattern in the machine. Particularly if you do a lot of numerical analysis, the only numbers that exist are the bit patterns the machine generates. They're the real numbers. The real number systems of a mathematician is purely imaginary. It's fictitious. It's not a bad viewpoint to adopt when you're trying to debug a program. On the other hand, when you are trying to model something which starts out with a mathematical model, then those numbers are more real and the ones in the machine are not so good. They suffer from round off and they suffer from truncation error. So the match between computing and the real world is not as good as you wish it were. And I've had to worry plenty of times, do I really believe this computed number is going to be what you're going to see. Now, Lewis Carroll, I just reread the stuff last night, or two last two nights, Through the Looking Glass and uh, Alice in Wonderland are really a lot about paradoxes in mathematics. He was a logician, not a good one. He made no significant contribution to all of mathematics. He was a bachelor who loved photography and liked to photograph nude little girls. Didn't like little boys, but liked little girls until they got about 12 or 14, and then he didn't like them anymore. Uh, he told these stories to Alice. He was a logician. A lot of the stuff you read there are remarkably interesting logically. Particularly, I was reading for a piece that occurs at the back end of uh, Through the Looking Glass, in which he tries 
to distinguish between the object, the name of the object, and the name of the name of the object. In other words, he gets himself in meta-linguistics. It's something like the story you know about uh, the two comedians who are talking about who's on first and what's on second, and I don't know who's on third, you know, that comedy strip. It's the same sort of thing, except Lewis does it somewhat better. But he does get you confused about a large number of things in Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass are, in fact, intellectual puzzles, where people get puzzled between the name of the thing and the thing itself. Thus, when you name your child Charles, Charles is a name. Your child is something else. You speak and act as if the child were Charles, but uh, you recognize, really, the child is made out of this, and Charles is simply a name. And the child would be very little different if you call him Willie instead of Charles. We tend to forget this. In our crazy way of living, we tend to identify words with the object. And this is not too good. You've got to be careful. You really want to do what I did in the lecture on programming when I wrote the simulator of one language for another. You remember I wrote a big path around there and I said, these subroutines define those operations. The operation is what is done in that subroutine. Meaning comes from how things are manipulated, not how words are said. And this gets you in trouble in philosophy, of course. Now, there's another thing which is seldom mentioned, but it's very serious in mathematics. And that is that meanings change. What Euler meant by a continuous function is not what you were told was a continuous function. And particularly, uh, what a polyhedron was. There was a well-known theorem about polyhedra, which I'll discuss some later time, and which the theorem was proved and true if you had in mind a certain limited view. But as time went on, you naturally thought, oh, but a polyhedra could be that, in which case the proof no longer held up. And gradually you extend ideas. Now, ideas have a habit of extending and going further and further, and therefore old proofs are no longer proofs. And indeed, I had a lovely argument with a guy in a math department one time. I drove him absolutely frantic. I said, no theorem is really proved. We have a rising standard of rigor. We've had a rising standard of rigor. What's rigorous? For example, this would be accepted, that kind of proof would be accepted, you could in class, but when I put it in between this, it's no longer accepted. We've had a rising standard of rigor. I find it difficult to believe we reached the ultimate of rigor, therefore any theorem which I announce and prove today, some future generation may have to patch up. Now every graduate student in mathematics has the experience of patching up proofs given by the great names in mathematics. The theorems of Gauss and so on, don't meet modern rigor, and we have to patch them up. The theorems are generally still true, but not always. In trying to patch up Cauchy's theorem about continuous functions, uh, if a series of continuous functions converges, the limit function is continuous, we had to patch up and say it isn't. It must be uniformly convergent. So sometimes the great masters were wrong, but most of the time the son of guns had the right theorem, but the proof was inadequate. So one of the things I claim Truthfully, there is no proof of anything in mathematics which may not have to be reformed tomorrow or the next day when we have a higher standard of rigor. There is no truth. There is no, none of the stuff you thought was in mathematics is really there. It's just not. Now, how on earth do we make out and get along in the world? How, for example, do you learn a language? You recognize that a dictionary must be circular. The first word you look up is defined in terms of some other words. There's no way out of it. And if you point your finger at a horse and say to a child, horse, the child may not know whether it's a horse or whether it's the name of the horse, Charlie, or whether it's a quadruped, or whether it's the color of the horse. The child has no way of knowing. So you can't point and define things. And when you try verbs, it's the same thing. Run, well, it means you're running, or it means some material 
were you put in the washing machine, the colors ran, or somebody ran for office? How do you err? Well, you look at what happened to your children. They had a lot of misconceptions. They gradually got down to some reasonable understanding. But you also find out that people don't always have exactly the same beliefs. Although they use the same words, the words don't mean the same thing for each one of them. Now, there was this famous dictionary that appeared in my time, but before yours, about the fourth or fifth or eighth or ninth edition, I don't, ninth edition, I think, tenth, maybe further. Anyway, the editor said, we will no longer prescribe, we will merely describe how words are used. There is not a God-given proper use. Well, this didn't go well. The reviewer in the New York Times, I'm oh, sorry, the New Yorker, went through the ceiling. He gave a blistering review of the book that purported not to tell you the proper way to use words. It only told you how words were used. And if you read Nero Wolf stories, Nero Wolf did the same thing. He tore up the pages and threw them in the fireplace regularly. He couldn't stand the idea. But these guys were right. They finally realized that all they can tell you is how words are currently used. They cannot tell you how words should be used. It was not on the stone tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Neither were the postures of mathematics. There were Ten Commandments. Although the story goes, uh, there were originally 20. You know the story when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, the crowd assembled, and he said, I got good news and bad news. And the crowd said, what's the good news? And he said, well, God wanted 20 commandments, but I talked about them down to 10. They all, hooray, hooray, only 10 commandments. It's much better. And they said, what's the bad news? Moses said, adultery is still on the list. Well, nothing else was there. You've only got those Ten Commandments from God. You've got nothing else. You haven't got the pastures of mathematics. Nowhere in the Bible do you find that. In fact, you find pi is three in the Bible if you read it. So it's clear you can't depend upon the Bible or God to tell you mathematics. It's not from where you want. It's created from in by man, and it uh, can be changed by man. Now, I suggest in the past, we have found those places where mathematics works best. That as you go on and try and use mathematics in new situations, it will not work as well, generally. Furthermore, you will find, I believe, that more and more you will have to do what I did. I had to create a different kind of mathematics. I had to say 1 plus 1 is 0, and I also had to give a different distance. I had to say the distance between two strings is the number of places they differ not the sum of the squares of the differences. Not Pythagorean L2, but the distance L1. The sum of the differences is what counts, not the sum of the squares of the differences. And then sometimes you'll find an AI called a Hamming distance because the sum of the differences is what you often use to measure something. A woman coming down the street far away, you say, oh, that can't be my wife. Uh, she's not this and this and this. Or you sometimes use a distance called L infinity or Chebyshev, which you take the maximum. You say, oh, that can't be my wife. She's too tall. You sometimes use one single measure, and sometimes you use many, the sum of all the differences, to say two things are not the same. You don't use the sum of the squares except in the physical world. Now, there's a Godel's theorem which I have to mention you probably know about. It's sometimes said to be the most famous theorem of this century. Hilbert set out to prove that the symbolic methods he wanted, laying down postures and so on, could be proved to be self-consistent within the system. That the formal manipulation of strings would prove their self-consistency. Well, if the string is rich enough to hold just the integers, a little bit of number theory. Then Godel came up with the awful theorem that it's impossible for you to prove within the system that the system is self-consistent. It's a nifty proof. It's a remarkable one. 
Von Neumann, who was also in logic at that time, has been heard murmur to some of my friends. If he'd ever thought of the idea, he could have proved it. The idea that you cannot prove the system is consistent. That no system may prove to be consistent. Now, it's not a theorem really about mathematics. It's a theorem about discrete symbols. You're likely to first say, well, language is a system of discrete symbols. But it really isn't. Mathematics has got uh, seven is a seven is a seven, and in a million years from now, a seven will still be a prime number. They may mark a different mark on a wall, but the seven will still be a prime number. Words change, and it's very likely the reason why we have a language which enables us to change meaning is that we escape Godel's theorem and we can cope with things. Godel's theorem states that if you're going to be really rigorous, and keep to exact symbols exactly the way they are and know always when they are, you cannot prove even the damn system is consistent. So we've got some ways out of the thing. We've taken several of these along the way. Godel's theorem shook us up for a long while and it's still hard to digest. And the proof is roughly, he enumerates the amount of theorems and the amount of proofs he's got and he shows you that there are going to be statements where you won't have enough proofs to go around. Now it's about as non-constructive as Shannon's proof of the good coding system. It looked constructive at the beginning, but after a while it broke down and merely said there's more of these than there are of those, or there's more space here than there is there, or the average is so good, therefore, in Shannon's case, someone must be good. This one was, there are many more theorems you could state than it will be able to really prove with the statements you got available to you when you enumerate them properly. Therefore, uh, there are going to be things you can't prove. You can't predictably prove the consistency. Because if you could, then you're led to a circuit thing. Now, if you add more propositions and postulates to the system, there will be new theorems admitted which you cannot prove. So it's a really a dog of a theorem to understand, and it's got a number of corollaries, but it's shaken up mathematicians to realize that we haven't got anything like what we wished we had when we started. The Greeks, I said, started with the belief that there was certain knowledge the Euclidean space was exactly right. When we came to non-Euclidean geometry, we were forced to admit, well, you know, maybe you could have these other crazy ones. And if you take the current general relativity theory, we have adopted these non-Euclidean spaces. We say that the space is not Euclidean, the space is warped by the presence of mass, and the light beam, instead of going straight, is bent. It's warped around the space. We put the whole thing in a non-Euclidean space, which originally, up through Kant, thought that it was. Honest to God, Euclidean space had to be correct. God gave it to us, and that's the way it was. We have an intuition for Euclidean, and that's truth. Well, we had to give it up. Now, computers at present handle discrete symbol systems, although you could argue about neural nets and some analog computers. The ones you're familiar with handle discrete systems, and if they're running right, they fall under the domain of Godel. There are a lot of things you're not going to be able to do with a computer. One of you may have learned the halting problems. If you take a bunch of things as being correct logic, then there is no way you can write a program which will inspect other programs and tell you whether the other program will halt or not in a finite time. There's no way of doing it. Not that we don't know how, but it's the same proof that the square root of 2 is not a fraction. The proof goes, if you accept that kind of logic, if there were a square root of 2, big, 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 bing, bing, a contradiction. Therefore, square root of 2 cannot be a fraction. That, of course, violates one to one's the intuitionists who don't believe that you could get away with that kind of an argument. But you people do, and machines do cope very well with yes, no. They fit very well the classical idea of formal mathematics and manipulating of symbols when every symbol is exactly recognizable every time exactly for what it is. But that isn't our language. It isn't the way we do things. So that while that's interesting, it uh, doesn't bear on the real whole problem. Now, the reason for dwelling on mathematics is twofold. I've tried to destroy your faith in it is certain, because you're going to meet a lot of new mathematics probably before you're through. Unconventional mathematics, which is not now known. 
because we're making progress. And just as I had to invent a different kind of mathematics, so was somebody else going to. But also you're going to find that mathematics does not fit as well. In the past, mathematics fit very well. Indeed, and for error correcting codes, it fits beautifully, exactly right. For classical mechanics, it fits very well, but not perfect. You're going to meet more of those, but also you're going to find the application of mathematics in fields which are not as well defined. I will suggest to you, which I've said several times, it seemed to me at Bell Laboratories, my predecessors did the easy problems on the average. They missed a few that I caught, but there's some more. We did the relatively harder problems, and the next generation's got the really hard ones. When I left, I was glad to leave them the messy problems. For example, it's one thing to get to the moon, which we did, although I'm not sure we can do it now. To get to Mars is a very, very much more difficult problem than to get to the moon. So the next thing, if you manage to do a great struggle to get back to the moon, well, you're only repeating what we've done. The next advance, you got to get to Mars. It's going to be very hard to do. And I wouldn't be at all surprised it was not done in your lifetime. Although you would have thought when we got to the moon, we would certainly Mars would be the next thing. We've relapsed to the point where, between you and me, I don't think NASA could get to the moon if you gave them the money. They probably couldn't do it now. Now I have got to count finally for, with all these things I told you was wrong with mathematics, and it's not, none of the five theories I gave you are correct, none of them are widely accepted, I still have to count for the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. How is it that at my desk, I calculate something, and it becomes so. Or how come they brought back s some trouble at White Sands when a missile fell down? I told you about it. They give me some equations, a girl calculator, desk calculator, and we tell them what happened on that shot. And then they can look and see what happened. And they realize what is wrong. But even more, how the hell did we calculate these moonshots? It's one thing to calculate guided missiles on Earth, where you have some experience. The moonshots in space were rather more out, way, way out, an adventure. We did not do that by repeated many, many, many shots to try and get it done. We didn't test things the way you classically think. We did something else. And mathematics is the tool that gets us there. We designed central offices. We assert that if you build it this way, it will stand this load of calls with this pattern of holding times and so on. And by and large, the central offices work like we say. Not always. I'm not saying we're always right. But we do a pretty good job, and we're doing, on the average, a better job. We are doing more and more sitting and calculating and telling you how the world is going to be, and we're doing it surprisingly accurately. It surprises me that it should be accurate. In fact, obviously, when I talk about it, I'm really telling you how much I was bothered. I'm sure I told you the one that bothered me most and still bothers me, the calculation that the bomb, the first atomic bomb, was off the whole atmosphere. I calculated, I checked the numbers somebody else calculated, and purported to say what the probability was. Well, probability traditionally is taught is it's the ratio of number of successes to total number of trials. You don't get more than one trial on that job. What was that probability? It clearly was not what I'd learned in textbooks. Likewise, what is this mathematics I do all the time, or I used to do all the time? And, you know, was right most of the time. The things behave the way we calculate. Yet I cannot give you a satisfactory theory of mathematics. Well, I will suggest to you in closing one of my favorite observations, which I've said to you, I think, before now. Everything really worth knowing cannot be said. Those things which are really valuable. Now, for example, in your case, consider the morale of an organization. AT&T used to have surveys, which I was involved in one, one time, where every employee filled out hundreds of questions. And we processed mad nausea to compare one operating company with another and so on. We tried to find out what is called morale. You can't define it. When you really get down to it, you do some mysterious things and hope it's got something to do with what you meant, but you know morale is an indefinable something. As some organizations have it, 
sometimes and some don't. As a matter of fact, some individuals in an organization have a high morale and some don't. But you can't really say what it is. You give some attributes, but the real thing itself, which is most important, you can't say. You can't say what truth, beauty, and justice are. So I can't tell you what mathematics is either. Tomorrow, or this is Tuesday, isn't it? Thursday. Well, tomorrow you get quantum mechanics, which is even messier business.